the Anglo-Boer War, as witnessed by Denis Reitz, and written in his book Commando, a Boer War Journal of the Boer War, by Denis Reitz. Chapter 20. We go into the Cape Colony and meet with a warm reception. The adventures of this handful of resolute men, led by General Smuts, forms one of the most interesting episodes in the whole course of the Guerrilla War. The Times History, Volume 302 The place of our meeting with General Smuts and his commando was in sight of the little village of Zastron, about 15 miles from the Orange River, and his intention was to march nearer that day and cross during the night. By noon, a start was made, and towards five in the evening, we could see a dark line in front of us, marking the gorge at the bottom of which runs the river between high mountain walls. Unfortunately, this was not all that we saw. Our side of the canyon was held for miles in each direction, by a cordon of British troops, stationed there to bar our way. Whenever a footpath led down the cliffs, there stood a tented camp, and the intervening ground was patrolled by strong bodies of mounted men, who clearly knew of our coming. On seeing this, General Smuts led us back into a range of hills where we waited until the next day, while men were sent in search of some neighbouring outposts to act as guides. At dusk, a young officer named Louis Vessels arrived with 50 men, a hard-bitten crew with whom he had been operating for over a year. He reported enemy columns closing in on us from the rear and said that unless we were able to effect a crossing that night, we should be trapped. He said, moreover, that the river was everywhere difficult, owing to the depth of the gorge and the perpendicular cliffs. But he had brought with him a veteran of the Basutu Wars, who knew of a path which might be practicable General Smuts decided to start at once, and in the falling dark, our force rode out. Accompanied by Vessels and his men, who agreed to enter the colony with us, we travelled on hour after hour in the dark of a rough ground, and then, towards three in the morning, we caught a glint of white far below where the Orange River boiled and eddied in its narrow channel. It was yet night when we commenced the final descent, but after toiling down the precipitous path to which our guide had brought us, and along which assuredly no other mounted troops had ever passed, we reached the edge of the water. In single file, we began to cross the river, a strong and turbulent mountain torrent, not broad, but so swift that our horses could scarcely maintain their footing. And as dawn lit the cliffs cliffs above, the hindmost man was through, and I stood in the Cape Colony at last. After a short halt, we took a path that led to the top of the cliffs on the opposite side by a deep cleft, up which we tugged our leg-weary animals, until far above we emerged on a wide grass-covered tableland, pleasantly dotted with native villages and herds of cattle at pasture. We were now actually on British territory, but the country here lies in an angle between the Free State and Basutaland, and Cape Boundaries 
and the region seemed exclusively occupied by Basutus, for there were no European habitations in sight. As soon as we gained the top, we scattered into small parties, riding from one native village to another in quest of tobacco and fodder for our horses. While we were thus ranging, a body of mounted Basutus, about 300 strong, came moving swiftly towards us. Some were armed with rifles, others carried battle axes, asahais, and knopkiris, which they brandished in the air as they approached. We did not know what to make of this, but we thought that they could not be contemplating an unprovoked attack on a white force equal to their own. General Smuts, therefore, contented himself with sending word for the various foraging parties to close in. And the commando continued on its way, without paying much attention to the horsemen, who, at a shouted word from their leader, came to a halt on a knoll close by, where they sat their horses in silence, watching the Boers pass. At this stage, my uncle and I, with five others whose names I did not know, lagged behind to feed our horses from the grain baskets to be found in every native village. And as we were not frightened by the Basutu parade, which we put down to curiosity, we allowed the commander to get a considerable way ahead of us. At length, seeing that we were being left too far behind, we mounted and followed our men, the last of whom were just uh, vanishing over the edge of the table, table land by a road leading to the plain below. By the time we could look down, the bulk of the commando was already at the bottom. They were riding along a road flanked on the left by a ledge of overhanging natural rock, part of the footwall of the tableland, which they had just uh, quitted, and on the right by a mission church and a long rubble fence separating the road from fields and gardens. A force moving down this enclosed alleyway could be easily ambushed, and we were alarmed to see that the Basutus had left their horses above and were scrambling down the final shelf of rock um, overhanging the road, crawling forward to the edge to look straight down on, on our men riding unconsciously below. We expected to see them open fire on the crowded ranks at any moment. But indecision, however, came over the natives. They began nudging one another as if each wanted someone else to start a shooting. And by the time that they had made up their minds, the opportunity was gone. For the commander was already debouching from the confined space of the road into the open plain. My fellow stragglers and I were worse off. For although the Basutus had hesitated to attack the larger force, their intentions were clearly hostile, and we wondered how they would deal with our little band left isolated on the rear. After hurried consultations, we decided to follow on and attempt to catch up with the, the commando, so we began to descend the slope. We reached the bottom, unmolested, but as we passed the church beside the road, we caught sight of many dark faces pressed against the window panes and white eyeballs peering at us from within. Then came a deafening crash as a volley was fired at us point-blank from the building. 
sending showers of splintered glass about our heads. Fortunately, the natives are a notoriously bad marksman, for he generally closes his eyes when he pulls the trigger. So not one of us was hit, although the range was under 10 yards. When the Basutas, lying in the rocky shelf overhanging the road, heard the volley, they took courage and also opened fire. The five men with us did the only reasonable thing under the circumstances. They dug their spurs in and rode off as fast as they could. But my uncle, with his usual impetuosity, loosed his pack animal swung his horse in behind a massive boulder that had carved from the ledge above and jumped to the ground. I had to follow suit, relinquishing my own led horse and riding in behind the rock a huge cube that leaned against the parent crag in such a manner as to give us cover against the Basutus overhead as well as those uh, firing through the shattered windows of the church across the way. <sighs> We opened fire in turn at the church, but we saw at once that our position was untenable. Immediately above, the natives were excitedly shouting as they fired at our retreating companions. And at such of the rearmost commander men as were still within range. Already, we could hear the voices of several of them craning over to get at us from above. With some of the enemy standing on the roof or as if it were, and others shouting from the church, not 15 yards off, we realized that to remain here could have only one ending, and we prepared to mount once more, although our chances of escape seemed desperate. Looking down the road, we could now see only two of our men riding for their lives across the fields, for they had succeeded in leaping the dividing wall. The other three men were nowhere to be seen, but two dead horses lay on the road, and a third was galloping riderless in the distance. This looked bad, but no other course was open to us. So we leapt into the saddle and rode out from the sanctuary of the, the fallen rock. The moment we did so, the natives in the church saw us and redoubled their fire, while those in the, ba uh, the bank above raised bloody blood-curdling yells and also fired. As we sped past, more natives rose from behind the fence lining the road. Fortunately, these last were armed only with asagais and knopkiris, which came whirring about our ears. In this pandemonium, we took every moment to be our last. But we ran the gauntlet safely for perhaps 60 yards, when the road fell suddenly into a deep sprite, which neither of us had noticed in our excitement. It meant salvation, although at first it looks as if it only meant more danger. For riding down, we saw some 15 or 20 natives squatted in a circle, intent upon something that lay on the ground between them. Before they could do more than spring to their feet and strike blindly at us, we were through. Instead of riding up the opposite bank of the Sprite, where we should come under fire again, we galloped along the bed under cover of the uh, high banks until we were able to emerge out of, the, out of range. Of the five men who had been with us, the two whom we had seen making across country got clean away but the other three were either killed on the road and then dragged into the Sprite, or else they were destroyed on reaching there. For we learned long after 
that their bodies were found on the causeway, dreadfully mutilated by the natives for medicine, in accordance with their bar barbarous custom. I have little doubt that when my uncle and I rode down amongst them, they were busy at the grisly task of dissection, which we ourselves so narrowly missed. We were out of danger now, but the prospect was not reassuring. True, we had got off without a scratch, but our pack animals were gone with most of our gear. And looking over our saddle horses, we were dismayed to find that they were both badly wounded. My brown mare had been hit by a jagged missile that had smashed her lower jaw and my uncle's horse had a bullet through the crouper and, an, and through the hind leg. I put my poor animal out of her misery at once, but my uncle thought that his might recover, which it did. I shouldered my saddle and, leading the injured horse, we advanced on foot, dolefully speculating upon our future, for we had only a winded horse and a handful of cottages between us in this inhospitable country. Far away we could see the commando posted on a ridge to cover the retreat of those who were still in danger, for some of the men had been within range when the firing started on us at the church and there were several wounded painfully making their way across the plain. When at last we reached the commando and had time to look around, my uncle and I had a pleasant surprise, for there stood our two led horses, safe and sound, with our blankets and cooking tins intact. They must have fled straight on when we loosed them on the road, and they had overtaken the commando while we were fighting below uh, on the shelf. Now they were contently ranged in line with the rest of the horses behind the hill, as if nothing out of the common had happened. So at any rate, we still had a riding horse apiece. While we were halted here, we saw that another party of 10 or 12 men was in difficulties. They, they too had got separated from the main body while foraging on the tableland earlier in the morning. But no one had missed them until now. When we heard the sound of distant firing and saw them riding into view two miles away, hotly pursued by numbers of mounted Basutus, they were in grave danger, for between them and ourselves ran a deep ravine towards which they were being shepherded. And as the ravine seemed impassable, it looked for a time as if we should have to stand by helpless and see them killed. In order to do what we could, the whole commander mounted and rode to the edge of the, the chasm. And yeah, fortunately, we found a piece of high ground from which we overlooked the scene on the other side and, we, and were able to drop our bullets amongst the advancing natives with such good effect that they uh, reined in. This gave the cornered men time to search the cliff for a way down, which they succeeded in finding under cover of our fire. And ultimately, they rejoined us without casualties. This final episode reduced my ammunition to just four rounds. And indeed, many of the rest were no better off. For the long chase to which they had been subjected during their dash through the Free State, had depleted their bandoliers to such an extent that 
the question was becoming a very serious one for a column such as ours starting to invade hostile territory. After this, we halted for an hour to give the wounded men a rest and to enable those whose horses had been killed to get remounted. There were seven men hit and as we had no lint, bandages or medical supplies, there was little that we could do for them. After a while, the injured men were placed in their saddles and we tracked away, with several bands of natives hovering in our rear, as if they con contemplated a further attack. But in the end, they retired. After a wearisome ride, we got beyond the area of the native reserve, and towards afternoon, we came across the first European farmhouse, where we left our wounded to be fetched in by the British. We rested our exhausted animals till dusk, and then saying goodbye to the wounded men in the house, we rode on for five or six miles before camping. For months past, we had experienced an unbroken spell of fine weather, bitterly cold at night, but cloudless uh, sunshine by day. Now, however, there was a change, and it came on to rain heavily, so that we spent the long hours of darkness dismally laying in mud and water. This weather, coming on top of the crowded events of the last 24 hours, gave us our first taste of what was awaiting us in the Cape Colony. And thus, early, we began to appreciate the fact that our road was likely to be a thorny one. The next morning, the sky cleared somewhat, although a penetrating drizzle continued for most of the day, through which we rode shivering, our thin clothing being but little protection. My own wardrobe was typical, a ragged coat and worn trousers full of holes, with no shirt or underwear of any kind. On my naked feet were dilapidated rawhide sandals, patched and repatched during eight months of wear, and I had only one frayed blanket to sleep under at night. Few of the men were better off and we looked with apprehension on the change of weather. For it meant that the rainy season was upon us. With its attendant hardships, the full extent of which we were yet to learn. Our course during this day took us through more settled parts. And for the first time, we looked at farms and homesteads untouched by the hand of war. There were men peacefully working in the fields and women and children standing unafraid before their doors as we passed. A very different picture from that to which we were accustomed in the devastated republics. The people were almost exclusively of Dutch origin. So they gave us unselfish hospitality. In the matter of clothing, they were hardly able to assist us, on account of uh, the military embargo, which prevented them from buying more than certain quantities. But gifts of coffee, sugar, salt and tobacco were ungrudgingly made and the first slice of bread and butter and the first sip of coffee I had tasted for a year almost made the long journey worthwhile. In spite of uh, the bad weather, our first day among a friendly population was a pleasant experience, which put the men in good spirits, and I dare say 
we posed a little before the women folk, laughing and whistling as we rode along. Our course later in the afternoon took us up a mountain pass. And when we reached the top towards the evening, we could see in the distance the comfortable hamlet of Lady Grey nestling to the left, while in the glen below was the old familiar sight of a British column crawling down the valley. This gave us no anxiety, for being without wheeled transport of any kind, we turned across the heath and easily left the soldiers be far behind. That night it rained again and a cold wind drove against us from the south. Our commander presented a strange appearance as we wound along. We had no raincoats, so we used our blankets as cloaks against the downpour, and the long line of draped horsemen looked like a tribe of red Indians on a warpath. Long after dark, we came to a halt spending a wretched wet night and at dawn cold and miserable we tracked over bleak country the biting wind in our faces until at four in the afternoon we came to rest near a place ominously called Moordenaarspoort the murderer's way the rain now ceased and a passing herd boy having told us that English troops were camped a few miles off, General Smuts decided to go and see them for himself. He took with him two young Free Staters who had joined him on the way down, and another man named Nietling from Pretoria, an old friend of mine. With these he left, saying that he would be back by dark. At sunset, he had not returned, and for hours we anxiously waited for him, until shortly before midnight, he walked in amongst us on foot and alone. He had been ambushed by a British patrol, who had killed all three his escort, and all the horses. He alone escaping down a nulla. Had he been killed, I believe that our expedition into the Cape would have come to a speedy end. For there was no one else who could have kept us together. The commander was divided into two portions, commanded by Jacobus van Deventer and Ben Bauer, respectively. Both good fighting men, but neither of them possessing the personality or the influence of a men that General Smuts had. To save us from going to pieces during the difficult period upon which we were now entering. We spent the night where we lay, and there was more trouble before daylight, for a porcupine came grunting through the, our lines, with the result that the horses stampeded in a body. They thundered off in the dark, crashing through fences and undergrowth in blind terror. And at sunrise, there was not an animal to be seen. With an English force in the vicinity, this was a serious predicament, for they would make short work of us if we were dismounted. So all hands turned out to hunt for the animals. Luckily, a few of the men had hobbled their, their mounts, which prevented them from going as far as the rest. And as these were run to earth in a hollow not far away, they were used to track the others. And after three or four uneasy hours, expecting to see the English appear at any moment, we brought back all the missing horses, safe and sound. We now travelled on for the next three days across windy barrens, heading southwest. 
The weather grew more and more tempestuous as we went, and we suffered severely from the cold and from the intermittent rains that accompanied us. Both horses and men began to show signs of distress. The animals looked thin and gaunt, and the men sat on their saddles, pinched, shivering and despondent, for South Africans are peculiarly susceptible to depressing effects of bad weather. They can stand cold and other hardships as well as anyone, but continued lack of sunshine soon makes them miserable, and for the time being, we were a dis dispirited band, wishing we had never come. By day, we were wet and cold, and the nights were evil dreams. Dry fuel was almost un unprocurable, and after a weary day, we had to spend the hours of darkness cowering together to snatch a little sleep on some muddy mountainside, or in an equally sodden valley. Soon we were losing horses freely, and not a track was made without some wretched animals being left behind, with tuckered flanks and drooping heads, waiting for the end. We had three days of this, but our real troubles were only beginning. Towards sunset one evening we came in the sight of a, the village of Jamiston and saw a strong English column to our right. So General Smuts moved us on. It grew pitch dark and a driving rain smote straight in our faces. The night was so black that it was impossible to see even the man immediately before one. And the cold so bitter that we became stiff and numbed, and it was only with difficulty that we could drag our horses along, for we were ordered to go on foot to husband their strength. When I was crossing a sprait, my sandals stuck in the heavy pot clay and came to pieces when I tried to withdraw them, and it was only by cutting corners from my blanket and wrapping one about each foot, that I was able to go on at all. Our guide, a young man from a local farm, had lost his bearings, so we had to grope our way through icy rain for five hours until we could continue no longer, and stood huddled together, ankle deep in mud and water, praying for sunrise. When it grew light, over 30 horses lay dead from exposure, besides others being abandoned overnight, and our spirits, low before, were at zero now. The rain continued pitilessly until midday, when the sky cleared and the blessed sun shone upon us once more. We moved forward and not far away saw a large farmhouse and outbuildings containing plenty of fuel. Soon we were warming our numbed bodies and cooking our first hot meal for days. The housewife at the farm gave me a pair of old-fashioned elastic-sided boots, and I unearthed an empty grain bag in which I cut a hole for my head and one at each corner for my arms thus providing myself with a serviceable greatcoat. My appearance caused much laughter, but I noticed that during the next few days, whenever we passed a barn, grain bags were in great demand, and soon many of the men were wearing them. As the people here told us that there was an English force in the neighborhood, we moved on later in the afternoon. First saying goodbye to Louis Vessels, the young Free State officer and his men, who turned back from here, 
as they had only come thus far to see our force well launched into the colony. I believe that they reached their own country again in safety. We continued for an hour and then halted in a valley. While we were idly resting in the grass, two field guns banged at us from a hill and shells came tearing overhead. More followed and taken by surprise, we leapt into the saddle and made for the cover of a line of hills to the rear. <laughs> the artillery was poor and neither man nor horse was hit. Once in safety, we put our animals out of harm's way and climbed up to see what the English meant to do. We can now see a column of horse coming down towards us, uh, around a spur that had previously hidden them from view. There were about 600 of them, and they had with them two 15-pounder Armstrong guns and several pom-poms, which unlimbered and opened fire, while their horsemen cautiously approached us. After a time, they quickened pace as though to attack. But coming under our fire, they took cover behind some farmhouses and crawls. In spite of the shelling and a lively exchange of rifle fire, there were apparently no casualties on either side, and the affair terminated after dark. I did not fire a single shot on account of the state of my cartridge belts, and the others fired no more than was necessary to stave off the enemy. Because, as I said before, the ammunition question was an exceedingly serious one. When the light went out, we withdrew to a farm close by, hoping for a real rest this time, as we had not enjoyed a full night's sleep since we crossed the Orange River, more than a week before. We did not get that night's rest, for at three o'clock the next morning, we were ordered up in the dark and started in a cold drizzle of rain on a record march. Our men were weakened by long privations. Our ammunition had dwindled to vanishing point, and our horses were in such last stages of the exhaustion, yet during the next six days, beset on all sides, we marched and fought, and in the end, successfully got through 